who was pretty good to me. He has contributed to the pioneering work on my love stream, learn objects and metal traders, podcasting, working on the physical research. Today is developing VR software, a personal learning environment helping a Today, the topic of this presentation uh, the word of this previous OER network. Now, let's welcome. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'm hoping you all hear me okay. And if you do hear me okay, if you could just indicate in the chat area at the lower right hand side of your screen. And I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes. This is a very brief presentation on the topic of the distributed open educational resource network. Um, and then there'll be 10 minutes after that for questions. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's 10 p.m. here at my office at home in Canada. And I'm pleased to be able to speak to you in Beijing and to people around the world. I see already Mustafa is here from Bangladesh. So hi, Mustafa. So open educational resources is a topic that's been around for Oh, almost 20 years now the idea of open content has been open has been around for a lot longer and it's something that's receiving current attention just recently in fact within the last uh, few weeks uh, the uh, UNESCO United Nations uh, UNESCO made a recommendation regarding open educational resources encouraging countries to develop them, to share them, to use them. And the link to that is available on the slide there. And they define open educational resources as teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, although usually we talk about digital OER that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost, in other words, free, access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no limited restrictions. This is an idea that's been, in fact, a dream of many people for a long time the idea of making educational resources widely available. There are various types of open educational resources. They might be course modules. They might be resources like this slide presentation, which I will make available as an open educational resource after the presentation. They might be ebooks or e-textbooks or some of the materials like quizzes or instructor guides accompanying, accompanying an ebook. Or they might be entire courses, like the massive open online course, which I and my colleagues across Canada and around the world have had a hand in developing. But open educational resources are not without their challenges. We look at open educational resources, they're typically defined in terms of how they are licensed. And there are usually five conditions attached to an open educational resource. The right to retain a resource, or as I think of this, the right to access the resource, which to my mind is the paramount of these, because without access, there is no open educational resource. As well, once you have in your hands an open educational resource, the right to reuse the content 
in a wide range of ways. The right to revise the content, and this might mean creating a translation of it. This might mean changing the format from text to audio. This might mean editing the content, updating the content. The right to remix, to combine the content with some other content to create something new. And then, again, equally important, maybe more important than the others, the right to redistribute, or in other words, to share that open educational resource with others. To me, the right to access and the right to share are probably the most important, certainly for educational materials. I do appreciate the need to be able to reuse and revise and remix, but really open educational resources are about the creation, the sharing, the distribution of these. Uh, I sometimes think of these resources almost as though they were words or characters in a language. And when we access them and use them, we are actually speaking to each other using these resources. But as I said, uh, there are issues with open educational resources. Uh, here's a list that I, I pulled off the internet. And it's a fairly common list. Permanence. Uh, an open educational resource can disappear. Um, you know, you, you put it up on an institutional repository and then the institution loses its funding and closes down its repository. Uh, companies, and there are various companies out there already, and this is the subject of a lot of discussion, might monopolize or limit the openness of an open educational resource. They sometimes talk about enclosure, where the resource is still free, but they've surrounded it with a learning management system or some kind of technology that you have to pay for in order to access the free resource. This is a problem. Open licensing itself is an issue because, you know, there are 200 and some countries in the world. There are different conditions to open educational resources. And then there are issues regarding other resources, ancillary resources, quality, editing, updating, the, the whole infrastructure that surrounds content so that the content isn't just an artifact that sits there, but is something that is shared, redistributed, improved, added to, and made something that belongs to the community as a whole and not just the person who created it or indeed not just the person who's using it. So I thought about this a lot and there are different approaches. One approach, and, you know, this is work in progress. So this is not the final word on this or anything like that. This is just what I'm working on now and the way I'm thinking right now. But this approach is to use content addressing for open educational resources. Now, let me explain what I mean. Right now, an OER is available on the internet, available on the web, and it is accessed from a repository using either uh, a, di a digital object identifier, DOI, or more commonly, the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator, which is the actual address where it is, the place where it is on the internet. Location-based access means that everybody really goes to the same place to get a resource. It's a very centralized approach to getting a resource. But we can identify resources in other ways, not just the location. And content addressing is a way of identifying resources. So take, for example, a resource, as indicated by the blue boxes there, or I guess that's 
more aqua or teal. Yeah. Um, the input uh, might be some text, it might be an image, whatever. And that's a digital file. Take that digital file and apply a cryptographic hash function to it. That's just a computer program that takes your file as input and then outputs a result. Now what it outputs is sometimes called a digest or sometimes it's called a hash. And the idea is that what you've done is you've encrypted the document, but it's a one-way encryption. The document goes in, the hash comes out, but you cannot infer the document from the hash. In fact, the hash is a fixed length, usually, say, 256 bytes, and that hash corresponds to the content of that input change the content and the hash is different when you apply the function. So you could take an entire book, run it through the hash algorithm, you get a 256 byte string. That string points to that book and only that book. Change one comma, one character in that book and then if you run the hash function you get a different 256 byte string. And that string refers to the changed version of the book. So we can use these digests, use these hashes, those two words basically mean the same thing in this context, to identify the resource. And what that means is that the resource could be located in any place. It could be anywhere in a network, an interconnected network of users, and you don't look for it by the location, you look for it by the hash address. And what you do is you ask one of your connections, do you have the resource that corresponds to this hash? If they have it, they send it to you. If they don't have it, they pass on your request to the next person in the network, and the next person and the next person until that request reaches someone who has that resource and then they send it directly to you. So we can have many copies of this resource in the same network. You might be thinking, well, if you're getting this resource from just anybody, how do you know they're sending you the correct resource? Maybe they're sending you a virus or some malware or something like that. But if you take what they sent you and apply the same cryptographic hash function to it, you should get the address of that resource. If you get the address of the resource, you know that you got exactly what you asked for. If you don't, you know that it has been changed in some way you would reject it and, and make your request again. So, what I'm thinking is that the future of open educational resources looks something like this. I call it content addressable resources for education or care. I'm not the best person at naming things, but I try. And so this is a diagram of what we're looking at developing over the summer at uh, MRC here in Canada. And it's just a simple thing just to test out aspects of the system. But we have resources, open educational resources down here, just text files, say. And we use an internet application and we submit them to this internet application. This internet application uploads them to a content addressable network. One such content addressable network is called the Interplanetary File System, IPFS. 
that actually exists. We don't need to build that. All we need to do is figure out a way to send the resource to that. Or, alternatively, we could send it to Git. Uh, GitHub, for example, or GitLab. Either way, what we will get back when we send it to these locations is a hash address. And we're going to get that hash address back. And then we'll store that hash address in an index in the blockchain somewhere on the internet. We're looking at Ethereum so that we have a record, an index, if, if you will, of all the content addressable resources that we've uploaded. Then we can do things like apply machine learning or natural language analysis in order to create metadata and other resources related to our open educational resource. These resources can be packaged together and they're packaged together in the same way a complex application is packaged together in GitHub using something called a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree is a thing that is created using hashes. So here you have a hash, that's what that H stands for, a hash of one resource and a hash of another resource. If you want to create something that combines these two resources, that's the remix part of uh, open licensing and open education, right? You want to combine these things then you create a hash of these two hashes. And then you can combine it with more things, create a hash of these two hashes. And in this way, we're actually able to build trees or graphs or chains or whatever we want of associated open educational resources. So we've addressed a number of issues We've addressed the problem of the resource disappearing because it's in this distributed network. There are multiple copies of it out there. Uh, we've addressed the problem of being able to edit it, to update it, to combine it, to associate resources with it because we can build these care packages that associate resources together. And because all of this is in a content addressable resource network. These resources are always available for access, for sharing, and for reuse. So the issue of licensing becomes much less important if the resource is in a care network, then the resource is an open educational resource. You can use it however you want. So the ideal outcome of this, to my mind, is an open educational resource sharing community. And I've actually borrowed somebody else's drawing here, um, this drawing right here, uh, in order to illustrate this slide. Although it's interesting, uh, you can't actually see the information crediting the person. You can't see it on the original drawing either. So I don't know who created it. Um, with a content addressable resource network, we can associate these resources with the authors on the blockchain in such a way that we always know what the provenance of the resource is. We always know who created it, who added to it, who shared it maybe, um, who translated it, whatever. Because the network is distributed, the content is available to everybody. Digital signatures in a blockchain ensure provenance. The entire community can both use and create open educational content with this. The accuracy of the content is ensured by testing the content with the hash algorithm and we can connect webs of content in order to create graph-based or semantic resources. Well, that's my time. Uh, I told you it was a very short presentation. Um, I hope this uh,
captures your imagination and maybe uh, creates some ideas. I know it's a very brief explanation and nothing uh, into the technical details really. But I think that this approach is probably going to characterize the distribution of open educational resources in the future and will produce a better system, a more sustainable system than we have today. So thank you very much. And now I'm just waiting for your questions and I see David is typing and Mustafa is typing. So I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, so um, okay, so we had some issues with seeing the slide. I'm gonna also, if you wish to download the slides. I've made them available online and I've typed the address of this presentation into the chat area www.downs.ca slash presentation slash 506. That's the uh, location. Right now it only points to a version on SlideShare, but that same location will later point to the actual slides to be downloaded. I wasn't able to upload them on the website, as well as to the audio and video recording of this talk. Like I say, I was creating an open educational resource as I was giving this talk. And this is what I think the future of open educational resources should be like. We create things, we share them in the care network, and then they become available to the entire community. Regarding the copyright, says David, are there any other open licenses except Creative Commons? Yes, there are. Uh, they are not very widely used. Of course, any person can, in essence, create their own open license. You see different kinds of open licenses applied to things like software, where there are things like the, the new public license or the... Uh, um, AGPL, Apache GPL, uh, or the, uh, there's a, a Berkeley license. So there's different kinds of licenses for software. Um, there is the uh, free license for software documentation, but again, that's not widely used. Mostly creative, uh, creative commons licenses are used for content. And I hear a person, so go ahead and speak, please. Uh, that's Mustafa. Hello. Hi, Mustafa. Yes, yeah, this is Mustafa. Yeah, thanks, uh, Stephen. It's a very nice, uh, innovative way of sharing the OER. Yeah. So, uh, yes, the technically, uh, I'm not that much expert uh, in understanding all these things. But what I understand that uh, for OER, yeah, for example, uh, someone created the OER, yeah, and mm -hmm. on the process, throughout the process, when I am using something, uh, some OER, yeah, so I don't know who, uh, exactly sometimes if it is not attributed properly who actually originally created this thing and how mm -hmm. it has been reused, reused, remixed and, and came to me. So I think it, it should be an innovative way to understand the whole uh, path. So who originally created and who did what. So, so at my uh, level, for example, I am remixing something, but there is a history of the whole uh, process or the, the, the journey. So that is very important to, to know. If it is visible throughout this process, it will be actually uh, really excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, and, and this has to be built into it, you know, much the way it's built into GitHub. And a lot of these ideas come from ideas related to GitHub, not exclusively, but, uh, but uh, you can build digital signatures right into the hash address of the resource. So you have provenance there. And so somebody else can't come along and take credit for that resource. 
And then the other thing is, uh, and, and this is why we added it, uh, to have the recording, you know, the record of the creation of the resource and the uploading of the resource uh, on a blockchain so that if for some reason the resource gets separated from the attribution, we can still go back and look in the blockchain and see that, oh yes, this attribution has been recorded here. We know that this person created the resource. But it needs to be built in. Um, probably be on my ability to build all of that. Anyone else? We got four minutes. Four minutes. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and it's interesting seeing a variety of very different names in the uh, participant list. Uh, we have a question from Eileen. Um, I want to ask you how we can make sure that the accuracy of the content is ensured by testing the content with the hash algorithm. So, okay, to be precise, right, what we're testing with the hash algorithm uh, is whether the content that we received is the content that we asked for. Is the hash algorithm reliable? Yes, it is. Uh, this is a very widely understood technology. There are different kinds of algorithms. Some of them are not reliable, but we know which ones are not reliable. Uh, what's really important is that the, the uh, hash needs to be long enough so that um, we can be sure that it points to one unique resource. If it's too short, you might get duplicates and that, that gets confusing. Um, the other thing is the hash algorithm has to be strong enough such that you can't create a fake item with the same hash. And that's a property of these algorithms. And that's something that's known whether or cannot do that. So yeah, as Mustafa says, uh, the process will reduce the fear of sharing educational resources. And I think that's really important. And, and we see that a lot even now. Um, when open source software is being shared. Uh, this open source software is shared with a hash of the software so that you know that you're receiving the actual code that you thought you were receiving. Very important because you don't want to load something dangerous on your computer. Wow, horns from somewhere else in the world. <laughs> Are those horns from Bangladesh? They must be. Uh, when we remix, really confused in using the right license. Can it be addressed too? So, I have two things to say about that. Um, first of all, if the content is in this content addressable resource network, then it is assumed to be part of this network to be remixed with anything else in this network, which eliminates the problem of licenses entirely. Anything shared this way can be remixed with anything else shared this way. Uh, secondly, uh, I think a various people for various reasons have created a lot of confusion about licenses and remixing and this is this applies mostly to publications on print uh, where you are actually taking two things and merging them into one thing on the web content doesn't work that way on the web, you can have a web page with one license and an image with another license and an audio recording with another license, no problem. 
because you're not making them all into one thing. Rather, you're associating them. And if you associate them, then it doesn't matter what the licenses are. It's only if you merge them together. But mostly, nobody does that except commercial publishers. Um, oh, that's too Mustafa. Okay. <laughs> uh, some right attribution is also a matter. If it is built in, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, I want it built in. I think that's a really important element of it. Um, just for provenance, just so that you know, we know who created the resource. Ultimately, this may as well help us to evaluate the reliability of the resource. If we know who created it, we know whether this person is a reliable creator of resources. Um, Maybe. You know, I mean, there's a lot to be worked out there, I think. So thank you for the kind words, Mustafa. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, probably other people will do most of the actual work to make this happen. Uh, but I'm hoping that the ideas that I've expressed inspires them to do this work. And uh, in the meantime, I and my colleagues at National Research Council will continue to work on developing prototypes and applying this idea and testing it out and seeing how it works. So, yeah. so, thank you everyone. We've reached the end of the webinar and uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to be with you here today and I hope to see you all sometime in the future. Tomorrow we'll have another two webinars about the OER and SEC. Good night, and then, good time, and good night. Welcome.